My husband became controlling and abusive. I planned my escape before he returned home. I, 29F, have been married to my husband, 30M, who I'll call Alex Alex and I, met in college during our freshman year. We started off as just friends and got married seven months ago. I've gotten along with his family, but we aren't super close, but we're friendly enough. The problem is that Alex has begun to make me incredibly uncomfortable. Firstly, he's begun to ask me who I'm meeting with, where, what we plan on doing, how long every single time I leave the house without him. At first, I just thought he was being protective and a good partner just in case something happened, but then he started checking my phone after the visits, vetting and researching each of my friends as well. He also has been pursuing me to link my bank account to his, as he's in charge of the finances when he was perfectly fine with keeping them separate before. We fight about it almost every day. Finally, yesterday. When he was preparing to go on a work trip for two weeks in California, he demanded I wear a tracker so he could keep an eye on me while he's gone. I can't do this anymore. I feel like I'm suffocating and his family who I've spoken to about his worrying behavior just said he's being careful and protective as a good husband should. I need to gather my things together and find a way to be gone before he gets home without tipping him off. He's always threatened that if he ever found me cheating on him he'd divorce papers the same day. He keeps a filled out copy on his desk. I'm going to submit those the day I leave, but there's so much to do. Bergen finding a new place to live, seeing if my job has any transfers available, packing and moving in two weeks. His return flight is on May 11th, so I need to move quickly. I'm posting here, because I don't have any close family, and I can't risk dragging my friends into this as we share the same friends. I just needed a place to vent and ask if anyone has any advice on the easiest and safest way to do this. Edit, oh my god you guys are amazing. I never even thought to not use his divorce papers. I'll check for cameras before I start any packing or prepping. I may also shred his divorce papers just in case and look into getting a lawyer for myself. I'm in a no-fault divorce state. That much I remember which will help. I'll update again when I know more. The tracker he wants me to use is a small clip to on the belt or waistband. I'll wear it unless I'm going or doing something related to me leaving. No pets yet, thankfully. Update 1. So I've gotten a lot of support and helpful advice along with questions I thought I should clarify before I proceed with the update. Some asked why I'd be hiding things from Alex regarding going out and who I'm meeting with. I don't, and I have nothing to hide. However, when he begins to double-check everything I tell him with the other people there right down to each person I talked to and what I said. Did I send any text messages? Did I order food? How much did I eat? That's when it started to feel like I was slowly being pushed into a corner. It didn't start that bad, but gradually grew worse over time. All of the Reddit subs my in-laws' families are part of are related gardening and DIY, so I highly doubt they'll see this. If so, by the time they do, I'll hopefully be gone. I talked about my job and explained things to my manager. And they promised to look into openings in other states to see if they could get me into one. They'll have an update on that in three days. I trust that my bank account is secured, considering he's tried to get into it before and failed. I found one camera in the kitchen, another in the living room, and one in our bedroom. As such, I've left them in place for now and done all other planning, either in the bathroom pretending I'm taking a bath. I'm honestly staying away from the domestic violence services as my sister-in-law is unfortunately higher up than those considering she volunteers there and. I have a feeling if I did show up there they would know in a heartbeat. I can't look for apartments until I get the update from my work, but either or I'm still going to be leaving the state. The day before I do I will be changing my number carrier and wiping my laptop and all of his electronics before I do. I've met with two lawyers so far and had them look over the paperwork. My husband had prepared and both said that it did have some clauses in it. That could have caused me some trouble down the line. What alarmed all of us was the fact that several of those clauses dealt with future children and not as a hypothetical. Like several hair suggested, I have a feeling he fully intended on getting me pregnant to keep me trapped and tied to him. There are three other locations. My job could send me two and I have. As a precaution I began looking into all three cities and housing in the areas. Just in case one of those, this is the one they send me to. Even if they don't have an opening that they can push me into then I will just have to quit, move and figure things out on my own. I have enough money to live and survive for a few months until I can pick up another job. Unfortunately all of our friends are mutuals and would likely be unaware of the consequences of saying or sharing anything I do or say with my husband. I don't have any surviving close family and obviously my in-laws are not a good resource to rely on. I am on my own unfortunately, other than the wonderful bonds I've begun to make here. I will update again if I get more information or something else happens. Otherwise all updates when my work gets back to me. I do plan on leaving before he returns though, just to make sure that I'm not anywhere near here at that time. My work has an opening I qualify for that will not only shift me across the country, but also comes with a salary increase as well. I've started telling my in-laws and friends that I'm planning a surprise outing for when my husband gets back for just the two of us. This way, 
People don't give me odd looks if they see me out and about. I've even gone as far as asking Mill to show me his favorite recipes. Meanwhile, I've found a moving company that while small is willing to work in a storm. The reason is in five days we're supposed to get hit with a large storm front. I plan to shut off the breaker and say we lost power if he asks, just as several people here suggested, and even send him a short clip of the storm. I will have all of my stuff move that afternoon, and I will be flying out once the weather has cleared enough to do so. I have a lawyer who will push my divorce through, and I've filled out the necessary paperwork so that I don't have to be here for it. I'm not suing for assets or alimony, and I've shredded his divorce papers as well. I've set up a cheap phone plan through Cricket. Until this is all said and done at which point I will find a new carrier, number and phone. This one is being wiped and left behind. My laptop is provided by my work and the IT department inspected it thoroughly and it was clean thankfully. No other electronics aside from my laptop and new phone will be coming with me. If Alex needs to talk to me, he can do it through my lawyer. Not sure if anything else will happen. My fingers are crossed that he doesn't think anything's amiss until after I leave and I'm not turning the breaker back on when I do. He can when he gets home. My work is covering the plane ticket, so that at least is one expense I don't have to finagle in. Update 3. It's been a busy week, but I've gotten so much done. Firstly, I am now out of the house and am currently in a hotel while I look for an apartment. It's a big city, bustling with people no matter where you look. We had a pretty bad storm system hit back home that actually lasted two days. High winds, thunder, lightning and even hail everywhere. I didn't take much from the house, my documents, clothes, and important sentimental items. I left all of the furniture and electronics behind. I cleaned the house top to bottom and took pictures on my phone, so he couldn't claim I damaged anything when I left. My lawyer has already started divorce proceedings and my husband will be served on the 8th. His plane is due to land early in the morning and the sheriff will be there at the house waiting for him. He is very much about public appearances and reputation. My lawyer will be calling him as well to inform him that I am more than willing to air out everything to the public about his actions if it means securing my freedom from him. I will go to court, as long as I must to get this pushed through. I haven't told our friends or his in-laws yet. I will do that while he is on the flight to prevent him from getting wind of it before he's handed the divorce papers. I will be calling around and explaining why we're getting divorced, to try and prevent him from twisting this into somehow being my fault. I don't want him trying to claim I had an affair or something, so I want to get the truth out before he can twist this. I'm doing okay. I'm tired but yet I feel almost jittery and off kilter. I keep looking over my shoulder and monitoring what I say even when I don't really need to anymore. Hopefully that will fade soon. My work is covering the cost of the hotel, and I'm working on getting my other things in order. I also need to find a new GP as I want to get a full test just to make sure everything is okay. I don't know when my next update will be, probably when the divorce papers are filed, or if we have to go to court to push them through. I will try to keep my head up, but it feels like I'm in a whirlwind or something with so many things to do and think about. I kinda thought it would be easier once I got out of the house, but while the fear is smaller, somehow the number of tasks only seems to have grown. Update 4. Firstly, I'm working on getting an apartment still, and have applications in at three different places, and will hopefully hear back from them soon. I'm still going into work here at the new location, so I don't have to worry about burning through my emergency savings completely. I've gotten a lot of emails from Alex, his family, and our old friend group asking question after question. I have only sent one return email to Alex, explaining that I don't believe we are truly compatible, and it is best we separate now. That his treatment of me when I'd done nothing to deserve as such was just as much of a deal breaker as cheating was for him. I ended the email with the statement that I would not be contacting him further and anything else he needed to pass on to me or vice versa would be done through my lawyer. For his family and friends, I just typed up one email outlining everything that had happened and why I left. I told them I wished them no ill will, but that such treatment of his wife and partner was not acceptable. That should Alex get remarried in the future, I wish they would help support both partners and not just Alex Alex, from what my lawyer told me was livid when he was served. The sheriff actually ended up booking him for assault on an officer and menacing due to the threats he was shouting. His father bailed him out in a few hours, but with the testimony of the sheriff, my lawyer believes I have a very good chance at getting a restraining order. Alex, upon returning to the house, apparently lost his temper again, breaking the dining table into pieces as well as the TV and putting several holes in the walls. At least that's what one of the emails from one of our friends reported as Alex called him to help him clean up the mess. My lawyer already has pictures of the house I took, with time stamps as evidence nothing had been damaged by me. My friend reported that Alex tried to claim I'd been the one to trash the house, but the holes in the wall were at head height. Alex is 6'3", and I'm 5'4", so he knew that was false. Either way, taking the pictures definitely will help me so again. 
Thank you everyone here for the advice because I never would have thought of that on my thought. My work won't share details of where I am, as I do work with some higher-end clientele who value security, and that information won't be gossiped about and no. I'm not some stripper or escort. I deal with contracts, notary, and business management. As such, even if Alex tried to use my work to find me, he wouldn't succeed. Update 5. It's been a little bit, and I thought I'd answer some questions before giving my update. It may be a while after this until things change. Firstly, no I didn't bring my car. The public transport here is good enough to use without needing one. I have secured an apartment, and the building has good security. You need a keycard to enter, and there is a security guard at a desk right by the entrance to the building. As part of my contract, I gave them a photo of Alex and his family, so that even in the off chance they do find me, they won't be let in. The responses I got from the emails varied. His family said I was overreacting, and that I owe Alex an apology for the problems this has caused him. The pending criminal charges puts him at risk of losing his job if he's convicted. Alex sent a long email, apologizing and pleading for me to come home. He said he was worried for me, that he is willing to go to therapy if it will appease me. He wants us to remain together, and he didn't think leaving was an appropriate response to his genuine concern and worry for my health and safety. The friends gave somewhat lacking replies, saying that they didn't think Alex was ever going to hurt me and that I shouldn't be letting my imagination run away wild. As much as I want to say I was surprised by the lack of support, I'm honestly not. He intends to fight the divorce. I am letting my lawyer handle it, and I am also pursuing a protective order as well. Once I got approved for my apartment, I also froze my credit. I've changed my phone carrier and number, as well as making sure none of my documents list Alex as next of kin or POA. Some have asked why I was so paranoid about Alex and his possible future actions. The answer for that actually is somewhat simple my grandmother. I love that woman to bits. As a teen, she explained why my grandfather was never around. He was extremely abusive and manipulative, and her generation didn't allow divorce really. She wouldn't have been able to buy a house or get a good enough job to support her, and my mother on her own. As such, she endured it, shielded my mom as she could until my grandfather died. When I felt like I may have been overreacting, I remembered how she'd said she'd always wished she'd been able to see grandfather for what he was early on, when she may have been able to annul the marriage. I don't know when I'll update again, maybe when the divorce goes through, or if something big happens but until then, I'm just trying to keep my head above the water. Update 6. It's been a month since my previous update, and I wanted to share some of what's been going on in the meantime. The divorce is proceeding, but even though I don't need him to agree, and he's not. It means I have to go through the courts to get it approved. As such, it could be upwards of six months to push it through, even though I'm filing without attempting to claim property, alimony, or compensation. I just want a clean break and separation. Alex has attempted to use our friends to reach out to me, as he doesn't want to use my lawyer for communication. He's saying it's disrespectful and cowardly to hide behind my lawyer and not meet him face to face. Alex wrote me a letter that he did pass off to my lawyer, but the contents were him justifying his actions and claiming that in today's time it is dangerous for women to be on their own, which is why he was so intent on trying to keep me safe from harm. He wanted me to understand that he was trying to protect me as best he could and was hurt that I would just lie to him and hide my actions from him related to my dissatisfaction with our marriage and my moving. I didn't reply because at no point did he apologize. All he did was turn everything around on me as I was being overly dramatic, emotional, and cowardly. There was a second letter with Alex's from my cell. Her letter was honestly disturbing and completely justified my misgivings regarding approaching her in any kind of professional capacity. She spent five paragraphs detailing how Ariel abusive relationship looked like and that Alex was the furthest thing from abusive. The details she included were all related to financial abuse and physical abuse, nothing like what Alex had been doing. She stated that my attempts to smear her brother's name for attention and clout made me the abuser, not him. I haven't really been able to process that admittedly. Part of me can't help but wonder if she's right. I mean, I blindsided him by leaving as I did and am refusing to speak with him at all. My old boss recommended that I look into getting into therapy after I moved, and I think I need to. I've had a hard time adjusting to being on my own. I keep censoring myself and haven't even gone out to eat yet. I always end up worrying about what if someone sees me, what if I get in trouble for spending my money on something frivolous? My lawyer is continuing to fight for the divorce, and I shouldn't need to be physically present in court. Any meetings needed between me and the judge can be done via Zoom. I'm trying to avoid confrontation with Alex and his family for now as much as I can. Pass both letters to my lawyer in case he needs them. Our friends are mostly trying to avoid taking sides still, and I'm honestly approaching the point of just letting them go as well. I'm tired of fighting for them to understand at this point. I don't know if anything is going to happen so my next update may not be until around mid-November depending on how long it takes to push the divorce through. Work is going well, 
and it's helpful to have something familiar to anchor my day-to-day -day life when so much has changed and is changing even now. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you. I interfered in my son's relationship and caused a family rift, but our journey led to reconciliation and a stronger slay and at bond at the age of 50. I find myself in the midst of a perplexing and somewhat distressing situation involving my son's girlfriend, who has consistently been somewhat distant and cool towards me. My son and his girlfriend, both 25, have been dating for a while now. But the roots of the issue go back about three years to a time before they were officially a couple. Back then, my son was involved in what he described as a situation ship with her. This term was new to me at the time, implying a relationship that was more than friendship, but without clear commitment. He lavished her with luxurious gifts and frequently invited her over, yet when pressed, he admitted that they weren't officially together. She was an attractive online influencer, considering her options among several interested parties. About seven months into this undefined relationship, I met a young woman through my work who seemed particularly smitten with my son. It was during a typical bustling afternoon at my small boutique, a place adorned with colorful fabrics and eclectic decorations that reflected my personal taste for the vibrant and unusual. Among my employees was a young woman, recently hired who brought an infectious energy and a smile that could brighten even the dreariest days. As we arranged new stock one day, she casually mentioned her admiration for my son, having seen photos of him on my desk. Her interest peaked as she spoke of his achievements and hobbies, which I had shared in passing during our coffee breaks. My kid was in what he called a situation ship with an internet influencer, which is an informal and seemingly open arrangement, so I saw no problem with putting him in front of someone who was obviously interested. After all, the influencer was still weighing her options among several suitors, and he had previously made it clear that the connection was not exclusive. Given the circumstances, I believed that giving this young lady my son's contact information and urging her to give him a call was a harmless enough gesture. It could be fun for him to meet when I brought up the interaction with my kid later. His response was, at best, hesitant. With a vague okay, mom, and a non-committal shrug, he immediately changed the subject. There was no quick follow-up or spark of interest. It appeared to be just one more thing tucked away in the recesses of his memory, not important enough to take action on just now. My son's response was non-committal, and nothing immediate came of it, but eventually he and the influencer formalized their relationship. However, as the months progressed, the dynamics of his relationship with the influencer began to shift. Whether my introduction played any role in this change was unclear. But about three to four months later, he and the influencer decided to commit to each other officially. They started appearing together more publicly, their social media filled with coupled photos and sweet captions that marked their relationship status clearly to all. It was a transition from a loose, undefined connection to something more solid and acknowledged, which took me by surprise, given the casual nature of their earlier interactions. Recently, wanting to clear the air and address any potential misunderstandings, I approached her during one of her visits to our home. I attempted an apology if my actions had seemed intrusive. Her response was forthright, suggesting I should have stayed out of my son's personal affairs, as the boundaries of their early relationship, though unclear to me, were set by them. This notion of variable boundaries in each situationship was a revelation to me, and clearly a point of contention. My daughter, seeing the tension, suggested somewhat flippantly that I seek advice via Reddit, a reflection of her frustration with the situation. The girlfriend's reaction to our conversation was not hopeful. She became even colder, which worries me as my son is quite serious about their future together. The setting was our family living room, a space that usually felt cozy and inviting with its soft plush sofas and the gentle hum of the grandfather clock in the corner. However, on that particular afternoon, the atmosphere felt tense and uncomfortably charged. It was just the two of us, as I had asked her to stay back for a few minutes after a family lunch, hoping to discuss our misunderstandings privately. I chose my words carefully, trying to convey my sincerity and regret if my past actions had overstepped her boundaries. The autumn light filtered through the sheer curtains, casting soft patterns on the carpet, a stark contrast to the hardness of the conversation. As I spoke, I noticed her posture remained rigid, her hands tightly clasped in her lap. Her face, usually expressive and animated, was set in a mask of polite detachment. When she replied, her voice was cool and measured, 
her words carefully chosen to maintain a diplomatic but distant tone. She reminded me that the dynamics of her relationship with my son, even in its early stages, were for them to navigate and not for outsiders to interfere with. Her response left little room for the warmth or understanding I had hoped to foster. It was clear that my attempt at an apology hadn't toured the frost between us. After a brief and somewhat stilted conversation, she excused herself, claiming a need to catch up on work. The way she quickly gathered her things and avoided eye contact as she left underscored the chilly atmosphere. Watching her leave, I felt a sinking feeling of unease. My son is deeply in love with her often discussing their plans for the future with a bright enthusiasm. His seriousness about their relationship made her coldness towards me all the more troubling. It was clear that repairing this rift would require more than just a single conversation, and the path forward seemed daunting as I sat alone in the now silent room, pondering my next steps. Adding to the complexity, I've had limited interactions with her, but one significant episode did little to help our relationship. When she decided to drop out of college to pursue her career as an online influencer full-time, I expressed my concerns bluntly. She was close to completing her degree, and I saw her decision as potentially short-sighted. I voiced these thoughts more forcefully than I perhaps should have, given that I was not contributing financially to her education. Now, reflecting on these events, I find myself questioning how best to mend this fractured relationship. My approach so far has evidently not been effective, and with my son's deepening commitment to her, the need to reconcile, for the sake of family harmony, feels urgent. I am contemplating ways to possibly bridge this gap, seeking to understand her perspective more fully and to communicate my intentions without overstepping boundaries. It's a delicate balance to strike, one that I hope, with time and effort, can be achieved. Are there any ways I can salvage the relationship? She didn't seem to appreciate our conversation and is getting even colder. My son, however, seems to be really determined to marry her. Update. I wasn't planning to share more at this point, preferring instead to keep things simple and civil. However, events took a turn that forced the issue out into the open. My daughter felt compelled to share our family troubles with my husband, perhaps hoping for a resolution that seemed beyond my reach. My husband, typically a steady presence though often absent due to his work which requires him to travel, is deeply invested in the well-being of our family. His career has enabled us to live more comfortably than many in our community, but it comes with the cost of his frequent absence. This time, he returned unexpectedly early and walked into the midst of unresolved tension. Unhappy with what he perceived as ongoing issues with our son, he made the drastic decision to ask him to leave our home, a course of action I hadn't anticipated and wasn't prepared for. I wasn't there when he arrived. I only came back to find that my son had already packed some essentials and left. The reality of seeing his space empty brought an ache, a deep, unsettling feeling that things were spiraling out of my control. Meanwhile, my son's messages filled my phone, his words echoing his hurt and disbelief at being cast out, describing our actions as heartless. With my husband leaving town again the following day, the responsibility to manage the fallout and maintain our home fell heavily on my shoulders. He assured me that he would handle things concerning our son from afar, a statement that left me both relieved and distressed. How could we bridge such a significant rift with distance between us? My daughter, aligning with her father, showed little sympathy for her brother. Her reactions have been fierce, further straining the delicate threads holding us together. Whenever my son has attempted to return home to talk, their interactions have escalated quickly into shouting matches, leaving no room for the calm discussion we so desperately need. In the family home where warmth and laughter once permeated the air, a heavy tension had settled, thick and unyielding. My daughter had taken a firm stance alongside her father, reflecting his decision with unwavering support that bordered on harshness toward her brother. Her loyalty, while admirable in some contexts, added layers of complexity to our current familial strife. Now, every attempt at communication seemed to devolve into conflict. On one such occasion, my son, hopeful for reconciliation, knocked softly at the front door his eyes searching for any sign of welcome. As I opened the door, the hopeful glimmer in his eyes faded almost instantly when he saw his sister standing behind me, her stance rigid, her expression stony. Before a word could be spoken, the air thickened with unspoken accusations and defenses. My son, usually reserved, began with a tentative can we talk, aiming to bridge the chasm that had formed between him and the family. However, his sister, interpreting his return as defiance, responded sharply 
Why are you here, you he know dad's decision? The conversation quickly escalated as voices rose. My daughter, mirroring her father's earlier decisiveness, accused her brother of being thoughtless and irresponsible. My son, frustrated and hurt, raised his voice in defense, pleading for understanding rather than judgment. The exchange grew louder, words flying like arrows, each one hitting far from the heart of the matter. His need for family support and our need to issues as a family. As their mother standing between them, I felt each word acutely, witnessing the thread of our family fabric stretching thin, threatening to snap. The living room, once a sanctuary of familial love, had transformed into a battleground of words and wills, leaving no room for the calm, constructive discussion that might heal our wounds. In these moments, the path to reconciliation seemed obscured by hurt feelings and hardened positions. The challenge lay in cooling the tempers and softening the hearts hardened by recent events. I knew that finding a way back to each other would require more than just time. It would need a willingness from all sides to listen, to understand, and to forgive. The conflict has left me feeling as though our family is being pulled apart at the seams. The very foundation of our unity seems shaken. I've always cherished the harmony within our household, never imagining a scenario where one of my children would be estranged like this. In my heart, I've never supported the idea of my son being kicked out of the house. I yearn for a way to mend what has been broken. In the meantime, I have set aside some money for my son, just a small amount to help him get by until we hew into Alpag, and it's a practical measure. But it feels like a band-aid over a much larger wound. I appreciate the supportive comments many of you have shared. They've been a comfort in a situation where easy answers seem an out of reach. I'm aware that my explanations might not capture all the nuances of our family dynamics or the complexity of the emotions involved. Still, I hold on to hope for a resolution that can bring us back together. I promise to provide an update when there's a positive development. Until then, Thank you for your kindness and understanding. Edit as weeks turned into months, the rift within our family began to show signs of mending, albeit slowly and with considerable effort from all sides. My son, undeterred by the challenges at home, continued his relationship with the influencer, his determination to marry her growing stronger despite the familial discord. Eventually, he proposed to her, and she accepted with a joy that was palpable even through the photographs he sent us. Seeing them together, Genuinely happy and looking forward to building a future, sparked a change in my own heart, and, slowly, in the dynamics of our family. I realized that regardless of past misunderstandings, my role as a mother was to support my son's choices and happiness. Acknowledging the need to bridge the gap, I invited my son and his fiancée to a family dinner. It was a tentative first step towards reconciliation. To my relief, my husband, having seen how deeply our son was committed, softened his stance and welcomed them warmly, the house which had felt too large and silent, filled with life again as they walked through the door. The dinner was initially awkward, conversations tentative, but as the evening progressed, laughter began to replace the my husband and I took genuine interest in their plans and aspirations, which included starting a business together that leveraged her online presence. Their enthusiasm was infectious, and, for the first time in a long while, I felt a glimmer of the family unity we had lost. My daughter, however, remained the last holdout, her feelings still mixed and her skepticism apparent. Recognizing her feelings, the young couple approached her not with resentment, but with understanding. They shared their hopes for the family's unity and expressed a sincere desire for her to be part of their lives and future celebrations. They also took the time to engage in activities she enjoyed showing up at her art exhibitions and supporting her projects. Gradually, my daughter began to respond to their efforts. It wasn't an overnight change, but each small interaction, each shared moment, seemed to soften her stance. The breakthrough came one evening, during a casual backyard barbecue, when she and her future sister-in-law teamed up for a game of charades. The laughter and camaraderie of that game seemed to wash away the last of her reservations. Months later at the wedding, my daughter stood as the maid of honor, her speech touching and heartfelt, acknowledging her initial misgivings but also her joy at seeing her brother so happy and well-matched. The wedding itself was a beautiful affair, set in a lovely outdoor venue that reflected the couple's style and the healing that had taken place within our family. As I watched them exchange vows, surrounded by friends and family who had witnessed the struggles and now the joyful culmination, I felt a profound sense of peace. The journey had not been easy 
but it had taught us all valuable lessons about love, forgiveness, and the enduring strength of family ties. The return of my son and his new wife to the family fold wasn't just a reunion, it was a new beginning, promising hope and happiness for the future. I discovered my husband has been hiding our marriage at work now. I'm even sure if I can trust him again, my husband. I'll call him Josh, and I have been together for six years, married for four, and we don't have kids. We have a really healthy and communicative relationship. We're both pretty easygoing, and I really love him. He started working at a large accounting firm about three years ago, and from what he tells me, he loves it there. He's made a lot of friends through his job, and he goes out with them for drinks and social events quite often and I've been totally okay with that. I'm quite introverted, so I've never been interested in meeting his colleagues or work friends, nor have I asked to. I've got my own circle of friends, and I'm fine with us having separate friend groups. After what happened yesterday, it only just occurred to me that he has never actually asked me if I'd like to meet any of them or go to one of his work events. I guess that's important context. Anyway, I'll start with what happened a few months ago that I had brushed off until now. I was at a bar with some friends for a couple of Friday after work drinks, and a guy approached me. He was there with some friends too. He looked slightly familiar, but I hadn't met him before. He seemed friendly enough, and he asked me my name, right? I think I must have just given him a confused look, because he followed up with, I'm Jake. I work with Josh. I realized that I recognized him from some photos on my husband's phone. I don't use social media except for a private Instagram, so I'm not sure if he posted the photos anywhere but we've got a very trusting relationship so I look in his photos sometimes. Don't hate me. This is where it gets a bit embarrassing. I'm a bit socially awkward and so I struggled to end the conversation, but he just kept talking at me. I guess he was already a couple of beers deep, but while he was talking, he said something like, It's great that you guys are still so close. I haven't talked to my brother in ages. At the time I was like, ha, huh. but I just assumed he was drunk and not making sense, so I ignored it. He started to get a little flirty so I turned to my friends and we left shortly after that. I didn't say anything to them about it, and it didn't seem like a big deal to me. I also decided not to tell my husband that I had met his co-worker Jake not to hide it, but because I figured the guy wouldn't even remember talking to me, and I didn't want to make it awkward for Josh at work by telling him his colleague tried to hit on me. I just thought no harm, no foul. But yesterday morning I was out walking our dog, Monty, He's a cross between a few breeds and has very unique markings, this matters I promise, and was on my way to my regular cafe which is in town. I was waiting in line to order, and the guy in front was an older man. He got his coffee and turned around, but stopped and looked at my dog and goes, Hello Monty. Monty was super excited to see him apparently, and so I guessed that the guy was another colleague of Josh's, because Josh brings the dog to the office a couple of times a week. I thought it was sweet to be honest, so I smiled at him and said hi. He introduced himself. I guessed correctly that he was a colleague, but then he said something like, aren't you a good sister walking his dog for him? I was so confused that I didn't even know how to react at first, so I stumbled on my words and just said, it's my dog. I regret it, but I genuinely couldn't bring myself to correct him and say that I'm Josh's wife and not his sister. It was just too awkward and I just wanted to leave because I think was suddenly dawning on me what might have been going on. He asked me something about sharing a dog, but I was able to escape the conversation by being next in line to order my coffee, and he left I seriously don't know what to do. Because what the fuck? Do I even ask my husband about this? Part of me is just assuming or hoping that it's a mistake, that he doesn't talk about me much at work, and they assume we are related, because we both have brown hair. But the thought that he has been telling his co-workers that I'm his sister, and evidently they have seen what I look like, so they must have seen photos, makes my stomach churn. I don't even know how I would broach the subject with him. I need some help. What would you guys do in this situation? I have only told one friend what happened because it's so weird and embarrassing, and she has jumped straight to time to plot his downfall, because she's my ride or die, love her. But I don't want to immediately assume the worst or ruin my marriage over something that could be nothing. I'm sorry for the long and rambly post, but I would really appreciate any and all advice. Edit. Holy fuck. Thank you everyone who commented with some advice, 
I haven't read all of them, but I really appreciate the suggestions from you guys. A small update. Josh came home at about 2.30 a.m. last night, but he was drunk so he just went straight to sleep, which is fine by me, because fuck having this conversation in that state. I've just woken up but he's still sleeping. First thing I just want to clear up, I've seen a lot of people suggesting I have crippling social anxiety, or I'm severely introverted which I suppose you could glean from the way I explained what happened, but I'm not. I meant that I'm slightly introverted in that I'm not the most eager to meet lots of new people at once, especially a bunch of finance bros whose weekends consist of unending sports bar beers, where I assume I would be mansplained everything until my ears bleed. Prob a negative assumption, but I'm sure some of you know what I mean. I suppose you could say that I'm confrontation-averse, in that I'm quite laid back and prefer to keep a conversation easy and positive. Idk I don't like it when things are awkward and correcting when people misrecognize me is one of those things, but I'm not terrified of confrontation. Also, my husband and I do share some mutual friends. I didn't explain that well, but our lives are not entirely separate. The way he acts towards me around our mutual friends is extremely affectionate and normal. It is only his work friends that I have never interacted with. I've also seen some people suggest that what is going on is equivalent to my husband beating me and me hopelessly wondering whether I should break up with him, or that I'm stupid for thinking my relationship was healthy when it clearly isn't. Like, damn, cut me some slack. I'm a real person, and this is an entirely alien and bizarre situation for me. My first reaction wasn't to assume the worst, but I do appreciate that you all have made me certain that it is a big deal. I guess I needed confirmation that the things that happened are enough proof that Josh has been purposefully lying, and they weren't just mix-ups. I'm going to talk to him today and ask him directly why he's telling his co-workers that I'm his sister. I followed the advice of writing my points down so that they don't get lost if I get emotional. LL. I will do my best not to let him slither out of it, and I hope he has some proof that his colleagues know I'm his wife. I know that's not the theatrical confrontation you guys were hoping for, but it's a Saturday, and I can't wait. Wish me luck. Thank you all. Update 1. Hi everyone. I just wanted to say thank you for overwhelming amount of support and advice. I'm blown away, and it really means a lot, and has kept me grounded. I'm sorry for the slow update. I know a lot of you were interested in what happened. I actually tried to update on Saturday, but it turns out this subreddit doesn't allow me to post an update until 48 hours after my first post. I'm also only allowed to post one single update, so I'll try to fit as much as I can here. Sorry for how long it might end up getting. I'll just get right into it. On Saturday morning I woke up earlier than my husband, he was very hungover, so he was like sleeping a rock. But you guys will be proud of me, because I followed some advice and decided to look through his phone properly while he was sleeping. I have been on his phone so often just pissing around on it that I had never thought to check anything very deeply. I know his passcode by heart. I checked all the expected things like Instagram DMs, Facebook Messenger, his iMessages etc and I didn't find anything that set off alarm bells to me. But I know from some comments that people who are cheating are good at covering their tracks and hiding messages, so I kept looking around. I saw he had a folder called Work, and so I looked in there, and he had a couple of Microsoft apps, Outlook, Authenticator, OneNote, etc., but he also had MS Teams. So I opened that up and had a look around. It did feel like I might have been breaking laws looking at his work messages, but I obviously had to. Anyway, I was already upset to see that he had a bunch of one-on-one -on -one chats with several female co-workers, which, at first glance, is obviously not an issue, because everyone works with people of the opposite gender and are required to communicate with them. But a couple of them were vaguely flirty. Nothing I would call egregious, but there would be the occasional message between them with some playful innuendo or a wink emoji. These upset me obviously, and they did send me into a bit of a spiral, but I didn't find anything that suggested he was having an out-and-out -out affair with any of them. Still, I followed someone's suggestion of screenshotting the messages and I airdropped them to myself. I still wanted some evidence of the lie though, some proof of Josh telling someone that I was his sister directly. A commenter suggested that I go through his messages and search for keyword sister. I wanted to reply to your comment and say thank you for the idea but the post was locked, so I couldn't. But thank you. So I searched for sis on his MS teams, hoping to find results for both sister and sis. A bunch of messages from all hands group chats or one-on-one -on -one chats came up from other people, all unrelated and about their own sisters or whatever. But my heart dropped out my ass lol when I saw there was a direct message from Jake, the guy from the bar, 
to Josh from a Monday a few months ago. Jake's messages said, Ran into your sis at the bar on Fry She's Single Right, and my husband had the fucking gall to reply, Nah, she's married. I literally almost burst into flames on the spot when I saw that. I can't even describe how much I was shaking after reading those messages. Firstly, that I could have confronted Josh about this months ago. I was and still am so furious with myself for that. Josh would've been fucking praying I didn't remember meeting Jake or that I wouldn't mention it, and he would've been counting his lucky stars that I never did. He probably thought he was hot shit for getting away with that, and I nearly burn a hole through the floor thinking about it lol, but secondly, I was just in shock that he had the balls to tell this guy that I'm the one who is married because he doesn't want anyone having it on with me, but he is allowed to coyly flirt with every fucking woman in the office. Anyway, I kept going back through the search results on his MS teams, and eventually I got as far back as two-ish years ago, and I did in fact find a message from Josh himself to a group chat. It said me and sis in Nusa Dua I clicked on that, and saw that he had sent it alongside a bunch of photos of him and I from our holiday to Bali we went to Bali for our second anniversary. I thought he probably chose those photos because he's shirtless and had been working out so he looked hot in all of them. I was in tears seeing all of this, obviously. I took screenshots of those two and airdropped all of the screenshots to myself. Needless to say I was devastated, and still am, to see all of that. I am still struggling to even process it at all. But that all happened on Saturday morning, and I immediately took myself to my friend's house. I'll call her Sophie. I went to her place to cry it out and show her what I found, and she was extremely supportive and probably more furious than me. LOL. At around 1.30 p.m. I got a phone call from Josh, and I hung it up immediately. He sent me a few messages along the lines of, Where are you, baby? I'm ordering food. Want some? Sad to not wake up next to you this morning. Guys, I have to reiterate how much I love this man, and how fucking heart-wrenching it was to see him still acting like nothing had gone wrong. It took so much willpower to not just pretend none of it had ever happened and go home to him. I know a lot of you will yell at me, or accuse me of being terrified of confronting him about this, which is not true. Please have some empathy. It takes me time to process my emotions and I wouldn't have even been able to form a sentence if I tried to confront him immediately after seeing those messages. I needed some time away with Sophie to recollect myself, and so I stayed the night at her place. She ordered us Chinese, and she helped me plan how I would confront him. I got a bunch more texts and calls from him as the evening progressed, and I eventually put my phone on Do Not Disturb. Sunday morning I woke up feeling more angry than sad, so I opened my phone and finally replied to his messages. Coming home now, need to talk. I kept it cryptic to make him squirm, to be honest. Because I was fraught with emotions I can't remember the entire conversation word for word, but I'll try to replay it as best I can. Long story short, I got home and he tried to hug me, but I refused him, and we just stood in the kitchen. I did confront him like someone suggested, I just said, why have you been telling your co-workers I'm your sister? I wish it would have been like a movie scene where the color drained from his face or he immediately looked like a deer in headlights but he didn't. It was like he had been girding himself for this confrontation for a while because he just frowned at me and looked flabbergasted. He just said, huh? This made me so angry. How are you going to pretend to be stupid after three years of lying? I basically said, don't play fucking dumb. Two of your co-workers have greeted me as your sister and I have proof of you telling them, and I know you're pretending to be single. Essentially, I asked him what he had to say for himself. He still played stupid. He became moderately defensive and just kept saying, I don't know what you're talking about, or, why would I lie about you? I cannot describe how furious I was at this point, but I was in tears, I always cry when I'm angry. So he was trying to comfort me as if I was having some kind of irrational breakdown. I showed him the screenshot of his message saying me and sis, and I said something like, you tell me. He just said, I don't know what I'm looking at, and I'm confused. I got so angry that I left again and went back to Sophie's because it felt like a dead-end road. I didn't think I was going to get him to admit to anything, and I was just getting so furious I couldn't continue. He was really upset and in tears, which to me was evidence that he knew he was lying and that he was going to have to come up with some explanation. He tried to get me to stay, but I told him that until you have something to say for yourself, we've got nothing to talk about. At like 8, 30-ish, he called me again and I did pick up. He basically asked for us to talk, and he said he has some things to say. So I went back to our apartment, 
He had written out a bunch of stuff on a piece of paper as if he had prepared a speech and sat me down on the couch. He asked me not to say anything while he was explaining himself. I'll write down the gist of what he said in bullet points. He started by apologizing relentlessly and admitting that he pretended to be stupid before because he couldn't immediately think of something to say for himself. He said that immediately after he started at his job, he realized the atmosphere was like a frat house. All of his team members were men in their 20s and 30s that were single and fuckboys, his word. He noticed that the one guy in their team that was married would either get picked on, or essentially excluded from any and all social interactions, that included getting lunch, inside jokes, going out on Friday, etc. These guys were friendly and welcoming to Josh, and he admitted that he was desperate to fit in with them, he hated feeling like fresh meat, so he was scared that saying he was married would alienate him from his co-workers, and at first just never mentioned that he was married. He said he did wear his wedding ring, and that they had just never pointed it out. A few months in, they were all out drinking after work. He admitted that after one of his workmates saw a picture of him, an eye on his lock screen, they asked him who I was, and in a moment of panic he said, my sister. He was really apologetic at this point, and he was crying a lot. He couldn't even look at me and he was just reading what he had written down. Anyway, he said that from then, he basically dug himself a deeper and deeper grave because they kept grilling him about me and wanting to see more pictures of me. He said he had let it go on too long and that he didn't have the balls to admit to the lie. They would always bring me up and ask shit like, did you give her my number yet? Or joke that they had slept with me, etc. So when he got that message from Jake, he essentially thought it was just him taking the piss. But he didn't like the jokes they were making about me and said that I was married in hopes they would stop. They didn't. He said that this wasn't the first time he told them I was married. In fact, he had said so pretty much immediately after saying I was his sister. He said that those pictures of us in Nusa Dua were the only pictures that he had purposefully sent them and deliberately lied about. After what he called an endless barrage of pestering from his colleagues to share the pics from his holiday. He said he was really ashamed that he did that. He told me that he had never had an affair or even considered it. That the messages between him and his female colleagues were banter and that it was commonplace to talk to people like that in the office. He also said he knows how disgusting it is, and he is embarrassed to have been acting like a fuckboy. Again, his word. He concluded his speech by apologizing again, and said that he was disgusted with himself and ashamed that he had lied for so long, but felt like he had trapped himself and that he couldn't find a way to get himself out of it. He said he knows he could have confessed the truth to either his co-workers or to me at any point, but that he didn't because he was a coward. He said that he'll confess to his entire office that he lied, and that I am his wife and not his sister if I want him to. He said that he will quit his job without a word if it would make me feel better, and that he hopes I can forgive him but he understands if I can't. Anyway, I couldn't really think of anything to say at that point. He went to lock himself in the bathroom and I just sat on the couch crying. I still don't know if I can trust what he said, and a lie that extreme is just baffling to me. If he can lie like that, for so long, what else could he be lying about? But his explanation and apologies seemed so sincere and genuine, and I guess to an extent what he said is believable. He has always been extroverted but very susceptible to peer pressure, especially from other blokes. If nothing else, to me, it's a sign of shocking immaturity. Anyway, I packed up a bag and went back to Sophie's, and I'm still at her place as I'm writing this. She said I can stay as long as I need to. I told Josh that I needed time away from him to think about everything, and whether or not I believe him, or whether I can ever trust him again. He told me to take as long as I needed, and that he will still be there if or when I get back, he said, even if it takes a year. Right now nothing feels real. I'm still dealing with the emotional whiplash from all of this, and I can't keep food down or think about anything. I've taken the day off work and Josh told me he's going to take off the whole week. Sophie and my other friends have told me not to make a decision on anything until my head is clear. I spoke to my parents this morning and my mom says it's just a bump in the road, but she and my dad adore Josh, so they're pretty biased. LOL. That's where I am right now. I'll take some time before I consider my next steps, I can't say whether I'm leaning towards forgiveness or divorce, but those are really the only options. I kind of feel lost in a void at the moment. That's probably the best way to describe it, just emptiness. Thanks again for all of your advice and support. I'm truly so grateful, and having this place to write down all of my thoughts has been helpful to get my mind a little clearer. This will be my last update, unless I make an edit to clear things up.
My fiancé cheated on me with a co-worker and blamed me for her affair. I called off the wedding and found happiness without her. Yesterday we had this meeting at our wedding venue, just four months until the big day. We took separate cars since she was coming straight from work. Near the end of the meeting, she casually mentions that her friend needs a ride after returning a rental car and asks if it's cool. I said sure, not thinking much of it since her friend's place is close and I'm familiar with her. I get home and try to reach her for the next three hours no response. Around the hour and a half mark, I text her friend to see if she got home okay. I'm worried as hell at this point. She finally strolls in and says, sorry, it took longer than expected. I hung out with my friend for a bit alright, fine, just give me a heads up next time please. Her friend hits me up a few minutes later, saying hey, sorry I couldn't make it to the venue, didn't see your fiancé tonight I asked my fiancé why her friend would say that. And she played dumb, saying she can't control what her friend says, then walks outside. Now I'm hella sketched out. I've never done this before, but I checked her phone records. Yep, I did, and no regrets here. I noticed she called her friend right after she stepped outside and had an hour-long call with some number I didn't recognize on the way to the venue. I grilled her about which rental place they went to and threw in a few more questions. She had answers ready, and they seemed legit at first. Thought maybe I was just being paranoid and decided to sleep on it. This morning I asked if I could see the text from her friend asking for the ride, so I could apologize for grilling her last night. She refused. I said, when I caught up with you on the way to the venue, who were you on the phone with, she says. Oh, that was the friend I picked up later, that's when I knew for sure she was lying. I told her I looked at her phone records and knew that wasn't true. Her story shifts again. I had to meet up with a co-worker to discuss a patient, who's this co-worker, and why couldn't you just talk over the phone, she says. I needed to show him techniques in person. His name is Michael now. I'm sketched out beyond belief. We don't lie to each other, ever. I ask to see the texts with Michael. She flat out refuses again. Why not if there's nothing to hide? Are you having an affair? Do you not want to be with me anymore? She pauses, then starts listing all the things that are wrong with me. I work too much. Don't spend enough time with her. Don't listen. I'm floored this is all news to me. I press again to see the texts. After about half an hour of going back and forth, she finally shows me, and it's wild. They're sexual and they're talking a lot of smack about me. Also, about how they want to be together and are basically in love. She started this job a month and a half ago, and he's a co-worker. Oh, and he's 15 to 20 years older, divorced with multiple kids. I've been footing the bill for her for the past few months while she got back on her feet. I've been working extra hours so she wouldn't need to take on a part-time job. We live together, have a house, three dogs, and a horse. Sorry this is long, but I'm just torn up right now. Didn't see this coming, and we were supposed to get married in four months. Any advice would be appreciated. After this revelation I had another conversation with her. She tried to justify her actions by blaming me for working too much, not listening to her, and not spending enough time together. She said she wouldn't have started talking to this guy if I had been more attentive. I tried to explain that I was working extra hours to support her and the family financially. She claimed she would have preferred getting a part-time job, which didn't make sense to me because I was doing this to avoid that situation for her. She downplayed the affair, saying it was short-lived and they only made out once. When I brought up the explicit texts, she deflected offering no real explanation. I told her that I couldn't trust her again, and this situation was entirely her fault. We discussed the future and the logistics of separating our lives. We decided on either I stay in the house and buy her out, or we sell it and go our separate ways. As for the dogs, we decided one of us would take one, and the other two are still TBD. She's taking the horse with her, and will board it at a barn. We had a three-hour conversation about what went wrong in our relationship. She again pointed out my supposed flaws lack of communication, spending too much time working, and being on my phone. While I acknowledge that I've been busy, and maybe not the best communicator, she never told me she was unhappy. Her actions were an overreaction, instead of communicating her feelings to me. She keeps insisting that I'm throwing away seven years of our relationship, but I reminded her that she threw it away with her actions. I confirmed the extent of the affair from the texts I read. They started talking about two weeks prior, and he invited her to play basketball at a park where they made out. She claims he's not her boyfriend and that it didn't go further but I'm sure it would have if given more time. She's taken off a few times recently, and I suspect she's with him or a girlfriend. It's been awkward living together, but I hope this resolves soon. I moved our joint savings into my individual account, calculated what she owed me, and transferred half of the balance back to our joint account for her to take. I've been working out daily and focusing on improving myself. I met someone new, a woman who's been through a similar situation. We've been spending time together, and it's refreshing to talk to someone who's kind, thoughtful, and independent. I've been seeing a therapist weekly and it's been very helpful. Now, for the bigger stuff I'm still living in the house with my ex. She's sleeping in the guest bedroom, and the only communication we have is about whether the dogs have been fed. I think she's a terrible person, and no matter what I say, in her mind, this whole mess is my fault. To accuse someone of being a bad communicator, and then use that as an excuse to not communicate your feelings and cheat is hypocritical. I stopped trying to reason with her because she's unreasonable. 
I've been pushing forward with getting the house listed for sale. I contacted an agent, had them come over, and was happy with the proposed sale price. She then requested that I contact two other agents to get their opinions, one of whom was recommended by her friend. So I made all the calls, set up the appointments, and met with these people. This is how the relationship always was. And even though it's not fair, I've been willing to do it all just to get out of here. After meeting with all three, we ended up going with the first agent. Pictures were taken on Sunday, and the house was listed for sale that night. There's an open house next Saturday, and it's already getting a lot of attention online. She'll be taking the horse to a barn somewhere, to be determined. I had a conversation about the dogs and offered to take one or none. She said she wanted to take all three of them to keep them together. They're a happy bunch, and I don't want to fight over taking one if that will break them up. Plus, it selfishly allows me to pursue a clean start. Unexpectedly, I met someone about a week ago, and we've been spending quite a bit of time together. I have no false expectations here, but I'm enjoying hanging out with her. She's been through a similar situation in the past and has been helping me through this. It's really eye-opening to talk with a kind, thoughtful, and independent woman. It makes me realize what a narcissist my ex was completely self-centered, dependent, and manipulative. I should have listened to the warnings from family and friends long ago. I definitely fell into the trap of a simple routine. I wasn't enjoying life. It was just an easy situation to be in. Nice house, lots of land, Great animals I didn't want to rock the boat, so I just continued on. You don't really realize this until you take a step back and reflect. Some might say it was wasted time, but I'm using this as a learning experience. I will not ignore red flags in the future. It's wild to think that all of this happened more than four months ago. With time, things have gotten so much better, and hopefully, if someone stumbles upon this while going through a similar situation, they'll realize that time heals everything. I shared the house with my ex until mid-May I was painful being there with her and the dogs, knowing that my life as I knew it had ended. We were roommates who didn't like each other. I tried to avoid her as much as possible, but it was impossible. We stayed in different bedrooms, but the dogs were allowed to roam to and from at night with the doors open. After the first few weeks, she stopped staying out late, and it didn't happen almost at all for the remainder of the time at the old house. The constant texting and phone calls, however, did not. I think they decided not to pursue a relationship but remained friends. I don't know for sure, and didn't care enough to ask. She moved out in mid-May along with two of the three dogs. Saying goodbye to them was awful the loss felt like a loved one dying. Selling the old house was easy, but buying a new one was brutal. Thankfully, the buyers of my old house allowed me to rent it back from them for a month until June 15th. I made offers on a total of five houses and finally got the last offer accepted towards the end of May. It's really naive as being out of the old place. The memories associated with that house haunted me every day. Especially after my ex left with the other two dogs, it was just very empty. Moving was a pain, but friends and family came through to help with it all. I've now been in my new place for a little over a month, and it's starting to feel more like home each day. I'm still seeing the same woman who is now my official girlfriend. I live a bit closer to her now, which is nice. She treats me really well, and I feel lucky to have her in my life. She helped me get through this situation and has been very understanding about my need for space and emotional ups and downs. I've never been with someone who communicates so well, and it's making me a better communicator myself. My emotional intelligence has also grown significantly. Overall, life is good. While this was one of the hardest things I've had to go through, I feel blessed that it happened. I was going to marry a completely self-centered, ungrateful person. I was so comfortable with my daily routine and didn't want to disrupt my animals' lives or lose my house, so I was willing to put up with being miserable. Now, I will continue working on myself and learning more about my own wants and needs. I will also continue to provide my dog with the best life possible. My first love turned into a nightmare when she ruined my reputation. Now, I'm struggling to heal and trust again. Back in 2023, when I was 19, I started dating this girl, B, who was 18 at the time. We were together for about a month, and man, it was a roller coaster. To keep things chill, I'll just refer to her as B now. B had a seriously rough childhood, if you can even call it that. Her dad was abusive and bailed on her mom when they needed him most, plus he cheated. Then her mom started traveling all over the country every couple of weeks with different dudes, leaving B and her sister alone for long stretches. Not exactly a picture perfect family, you know? So last April, I was part of this group that went to perform in a big city. While we were there, B, who was a classmate I'd gotten pretty close to and I confessed we had feelings for each other. Later that week, after this fancy dinner, she straight up asked me if I wanted to be her boyfriend. Honestly, I hadn't really thought about getting into a relationship, but I wasn't against it either. Since COVID hit in 2020, I'd been in a dark place mentally, struggling to find purpose. Watching all my friends pair up while I was still solo didn't help. Anyway, before I said yes to B, I wanted to set some expectations. See, I come from a hardcore Christian family, and those values are important to me. I told her I wasn't down with premarital sex and that communication and honesty were super important. I'd seen too many relationships crash because of lies or people not talking things out. She was totally on board and said she'd recently become a Christian too, 
and waiting until marriage was cool with her. So we made it official. After our performance the next night, we went to this ceremony for everyone who performed. B and I enjoyed some amazing food, and after we wrapped up, we headed back to the hotel. Her roommates were still at the dinner when we got back to her room. We were with a big group and split up by gender, so we sat and chatted for a while. We were both geeking out about being part of such a high-class performance and, well, being a new couple. A few minutes later, sitting side by side on the edge of the bed, we started making out. Looking back. That was probably the first in a series of mistakes I made. I'm not saying I'm blameless here, I know I messed up. When we got back home, we kept hanging out almost every day, which wasn't hard since we went to the same college and had the same major. I'd ask her if she wanted anything for lunch or dinner, and she'd always hit me with the I'm not hungry, it doesn't matter, or you pick lines. Oh, and side note, we're both a bit on the spectrum slightly autistic, so neither of us is great at picking up social cues. There were plenty of times I'd try to get close to her like give her a hug or a forehead kiss, but she'd push me away. She'd say she was overstimulated, or it wasn't the right time or place, or she was just too tired. That hurt, man. All I wanted was to give her a safe space, you know. We spent a lot of late nights together, making out and talking about our plans whether it was for the next day or way down the line. Eventually, my parents called me out for being out so late all the time. I told them we were just making out and chatting. They warned me to be careful not to compromise my morals, saying I was on a slippery slope. At first, I kind of brushed them off and kept hanging out with B as much as possible. But I did tell her directly that if I ever said or did anything that made her uncomfortable, she should let me know. I'm terrible at reading social cues and body language. The last thing I wanted was to hurt her or make her feel controlled. She acknowledged this and said she didn't see me as controlling at all. A few weeks into dating, things escalated. We both let it go further than we should have and ended up touching each other in pretty intimate ways. Just to be clear, we never took our clothes off. The most I ever saw was her in a bathing suit when we went swimming one day. After I got home and thought about it, I realized things were moving way too fast. I should also mention that when we'd go on walks or hikes, we'd trade sexual jokes. When we were alone, sitting close, I'd usually have my arm around her shoulders, and she'd grab my hand and move it toward her chest. At first, I wasn't comfortable with that and pulled back, but after a while, I just let her do it. But after some reflection, I knew we needed to pump the brakes, so I didn't try to touch her like that again. Despite trying to slow things down, it was tough. B was my first real relationship, and let's be real, I was and still am a hormone-driven teenage guy. Biology, right? Not an excuse, but it definitely messes with your decision-making. One weekend, I decided to take B for a drive so we could just talk. We cruised around for almost three hours, chatting about everything our future plans together, how things were going, stuff we noticed about each other. I brought up that we both had insecurities that affected our behavior. I didn't get into specifics at the time, but looking back, here's the deal. On my end, I was super clingy. Probably comes from not having many friends growing up and always feeling like the odd one out. So when someone did befriend me, I'd hold on tight which, ironically, pushed people away. As for B, she'd constantly ask if I was going to leave her or say things like, you're sick of me if I didn't respond to a text right away even if I was busy. She'd make little comments like how she didn't deserve me or how she'd broken me. She'd also brush me off when I was worried about her well-being. She had this habit of not eating or sleeping for long periods and getting hurt from walking on sketchy stuff like rusty metal or jagged rocks. A week after that drive, B calls me in the middle of the night and says she wants to break up, just like that no explanation. Naturally, I was wrecked. I asked if I'd done something wrong and if we could talk about it the next day, but she just blew me off. I told her I hoped we could still be friends despite everything. She brushed that off too. A week later, she texts me saying she doesn't want to stay in contact and that we should go our separate ways. I was crushed but told her if that's what she wanted and it made her happy, I'd accept it. No sooner had I sent that text than I hopped on Facebook to unfriend her per her wishes only to find she'd already blocked me on every platform. Fast forward about a month, and I get a message from a mutual friend. Apparently, after B dumped me and cut me off, she started telling all our classmates and mutual friends that I tried to assault her. That couldn't be further from the truth. The message included a screenshot of a group chat with several peers I considered friends, including one guy I thought was a really good friend. In the chat, they were calling me all sorts of nasty things, making threats against me, and even plotting to get me kicked out of college. Deep down, I knew they had nothing on me besides B's word and her little crew. I reached out to a couple of people in the chat who I thought were close friends, but they either ignored me or blew me off. At that point, I decided to ghost from social media. I deactivated my Facebook and Instagram after clearing out my friend lists, keeping only about seven close family members and friends, and I deleted Snapchat. I was super hesitant about going back to college, afraid people would come at me without even hearing my side. Oh, and guess who else was still at the same college? Yep, B, when I saw her, 
I tried asking what happened and why she'd make such horrible accusations. She said she didn't want to talk about it and pretty much ignored me the whole semester. Halfway through, we got this opportunity to perform at a concert, and B was part of the group along with most of the people who had threatened me. While at the concert, I ended up talking to the guy who started the group chat trashing me. At first I gave him the cold shoulder I was still angry and hurt, but eventually, I decided to talk to him for some closure. He apologized for his actions and said that after he spread all that stuff, a lot of our mutual friends called him out for jumping the gun. He said once he found out B had lied and made up the allegations, he cut her off and also dipped out from social media. A few weeks after the concert, B approached me out of nowhere and started talking about how her trauma made her cut me off and not confront me, among other things. Look, I get that trauma is brutal and can cause deep-seated issues, but it's not cool to hide behind it every time you make bad choices. And because of her lies and the threats against me, I don't trust anyone anymore. I've got two friends and my parents who helped me through it, but I'm not opening up to anyone else anytime soon. After she tried to explain herself, I didn't say much besides, okay, thanks, and went about my business. I'd taken on a bunch of responsibilities around campus to keep myself busy and my mind off things. Later, I wrote her a letter saying, while I understand that trauma is tough to deal with, it doesn't excuse the lies you told. I know I made mistakes, and I'm willing to admit that, but I'm not taking all the blame because you've got your faults too. You lied and tried to ruin my life and you shattered my heart and trust. I'm willing to be civil, but I don't see us being friends anytime soon. I handed her the letter, and she walked off to read it. Later she came back and just nodded, acknowledging she'd read it. Then it was back to radio silence, which honestly was fine by me. Throughout this whole mess, I've cycled through sadness and depression to anger and hatred, and now I'm somewhere between anger and indifference. Part of why I'm sharing this is because I'm still wrestling with it. My friends tell me it'll take time to heal, while my parents are like just get over it and move on I'm stuck. I want to move on, but I don't know how. I still feel like I deserve an explanation for why she spread such awful lies about me. If anyone's got advice on how to handle this kind of thing, I'd really appreciate it because I'm at a loss here.